Hi, John Hess from FilmmakerIQ.com, and today we're going to take a hands-on approach and demonstrate how direction and blocking can change the same script into completely different scenes. To me, working with actors to create the scene is the best part of filmmaking. When YouTube Space LA announced that they were hosting a police set for use, I devised a little experiment to demonstrate just how important these choices you make with your actors are to your film. In this demonstration, we'll take a two-page script of a police procedural and shoot that same script five different ways by changing the blocking and camera angles. Now this script is about as boilerplate as you can get. In fact, it took two drafts just to drain out every bit of subcontext from the dialogue. A perfect clean canvas to inject meaning with blocking. Now we had one full day to shoot on the police set. To pull off five versions of the script, we had to move quickly. We relied on overhead set lighting. It was adequate, but this is really more a blocking demo, so I wasn't too concerned about changing the lighting. Now, camera-wise, we used a pair of Canon C300s, usually shooting from the same angle with different focal lengths. Now, doing it this way creates twice the coverage per take and doesn't require extra lighting or special blocking that shooting opposing angles requires. It also simplifies the continuity a bit as your wide-angle shots will match your close-ups. For sound, I opted for the convenience of wireless lav mics. Now, in the past, I've been skeptical about using lav microphones on crucial audio applications, as I never thought they, were, they sounded that good. But this time around, I tried using the Rode lav mic connected to Sennheiser wireless transmitters. I had some glitching at the end of the day because the transmitters started to lose battery power, but the Rode lav mics were so good that if one transmitter on one actor was glitching, I could always use the audio from the other actor's mic. The audio signal was recorded on an external Tascam recorder at 96 kilohertz, 24-bit audio. I did have a boom mic as a backup, but it really wasn't necessary. So that's just a little bit on the tech. Let's get into the fun part. Every experiment has to have a control. And even though this isn't a scientific experiment, I wanted a base that could represent essentially no blocking and simple over-the-shoulder back-and-forth camera angles. If you're just starting out, this is the kind of blocking you might start with. I also directed the actors to play as deadpan as possible, zero out the inflections and emotions and just state the facts. Take a look. Captain. Detective, make it quick. I only have a minute. Any news on the Mendoza case? Uh, Jenkins isn't talking. He's been in there for 15 hours. Exactly one hour to illegally after releasing. And forensics? Toxicology came back negative. The blood work is clean. There's no fingerprints at the scene. Looks like we're at a dead end. I'm not a fan of dead ends. I don't like losing. We're fighting the clock. Mendoza's got an army of lawyers breathing down our necks. If we so much as overstep this thing... Myers, Mendoza's lawyer. What about him? Well, if Mendoza's washing his hands, you find the soap. That's Myers. Put a detail on him. I want to know every move that he makes. I'll put Nemia. If I'm right, that snake will lead us right to the price. What about Jenkins? Let him sweat it out for another hour. And then have a big showy escort take him back and Mendoza will think that he talked. Yes, Captain. Aaron, keep me posted. This unit needs this. I need this. I knew in the edit room that this version was going to be the weakest of them all. What I discovered was that without really an, any emotional cues from the actors, I was forced to rely much more heavily on editing tricks to craft the scene. The first cheat is to use dark music, which underscores the intensity of the scene. As for cutting, I really wanted to emphasize close-ups for intensity. Once we are in the sergeant's office, we open with a medium shot and then go right into close-ups on the actor's faces as the detective explains the dead end. As the detective is about to give up, I switch to a medium shot, giving him some distance and some breathing room, only to come back to a close-up when the sergeant starts presenting her plan. 
In essence, the close-ups are used to push tension and the mediums let us back off the intensity as you don't want to be monotonous in tone. It's this intercut between medium and close-up that creates the tension that's not being created in the scene. So this is what is meant by crafting the performance in the edit, using montage and musical cues to create the feelings we want in the scene. It's okay, but to me, that's boring filmmaking and really a waste of our talented actors. Keeping our actors and cameras locked down, here's what happens when you free them up to inject a little bit of inflection and do a little business. Captain. Detective, make it quick. I only have a minute. Any news on the Mendoza case? Jenkins isn't talking. He's been in there for 15 hours. Exactly one hour before we legally have to release him. And the forensics? Toxicology came back negative. There's no fingerprints at the scene. Blood work is clean. Looks like we're at a dead end. I'm not a fan of dead ends. I don't like losing. We're fighting the clock here. Mendoza's got an army of lawyers breathing down our necks. So we so much as overstep this thing. Myers. Mendoza's lawyer. What about him? Well, if Mendoza is washing his hands, you'll find the soap. That's Myers. Let's put a detail on him. I want to know every move that he makes. I'll put Nimi on it. If I'm right, that snake is going to lead us right to the price. What about Jenkins? Let him sweat it out for another hour and then have a big showy escort take him back, and Mendoza will think that he talked. Yes, Captain. Hey, Darren, keep me posted. This unit needs this. I need this. There is a term that I've heard used in directing before, or perhaps I just made it up, business. It sort of stems from the question, what should an actor be doing when he or she is not delivering dialogue. Watch most first year actors and you'll see them freeze when they're not speaking. Now, now that you've seen the scene a couple of times, you should be familiar with the main objective of each actor. The detective is there to deliver the bad news that Jenkins isn't talking. The sergeant then comes up with a plan to proceed forward. Business is adding a secondary objective, something that can but doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the main objective. For the detective, I gave him a pencil to play with. Now this is not exactly an objective, but a prop to manifest his angst in the scene. Now for the sergeant, I told her to search the desk for a missing envelope. And at the point where she realizes that Myers is key to the case to suddenly find what it is that she was looking for sort of a visual metaphor for the scene itself. Now with this bit of direction, something really interesting occurred. Watch the eye lines between the two actors. After the initial greeting, the two actors do not meet eyes. When the sergeant asks for the news, the reverse shot shows the detective looking down. When he returns his eyes to her, she's looking away. They avert eye contact until, bam, she makes a break in the case. That's the first time they lock eyes and except for a glance off here and there, they stay locked on each other for the rest of the scene. They went from being lost to now being in sync. Now, I wish I could sit here and take credit for that bit of direction, but I can't. It wasn't something even discussed on the set. It just happened naturally because the actors had something to do besides sit and talk through the case. The result is a completely unexpected but completely natural bit of visual storytelling with deeper context. This is why filmmaking is so much fun. But we just started. Now it's time to open up the blocking completely and really experiment with a one-shot version of the scene. Captain. Detective, make it quick. I've only got a minute. Any news on the Mendoza case? Jenkins isn't talking. He's been in there for 15 hours. Exactly. One hour before we legally have to release him. What about the forensics? Toxicology came back negative. The blood work is clean. 
There's not even a fingerprint to the scene. This is a dead end. I am not a fan of dead ends, and I don't like losing. We're racing the clock, okay? Mendoza's got an army of lawyers breathing down our necks if we don't so much Myers, as overstep this. Myers, Mendoza's lawyer. What about him? <laughs> if Mendoza is washing his hands, then you will find the soap, and that's Myers. So put a detail on him. I want to know every move that he makes. I'll put Nimi on it. You know, I have a feeling that if I am right, that snake is going to lead us to the price. What about Jenkins? Let him sweat it out for another hour, and then have a big showy escort take him back. Mendoza will think that he talked. Yes, Kim. Darren, keep me posted. This unit needs this. I need this. Let's change gears for just a bit and talk about production choices. Now, I went into this variation wanting to test out different types of camera stabilizers. A standard over-the-shoulder rig, a center of gravity stabilizer with the Steadicam Zephyr, and a brushless motor gimbal style stabilizer. The version you just watched was shot on the Steadicam, a device that I had never used before, but I've had extensive experience playing with and modifying a Glidecam 4000 over the years. It took about 45 minutes of playing with the Steadicam to get it balanced to the point where I could get the shot. Now, I'm not a full-time Steadicam operator by any stretch of the imagination. And after flying for about a couple of hours and 20 or so takes to get the choreography right, I really doubt I will ever be a full-time Steadicam operator. But the Zephyr was a real pleasure to fly and I got results that weren't too bad. Now this was the first scene we shot after lunch. After an hour, the actors and myself were satisfied that we had a solid take with the Steadicam. During this time, my second cameraman, Chris, had been working on getting the brushless motor gimbal stabilizer to work. It was still acting wonky on us, so I gave him a little bit more time and reshot the scene using the shoulder mount system. Now, having some experience in event and broadcast video, shooting shoulder mount is really intuitive and almost liberating for me. I know exactly how to point the camera at what I want to see. I know how to move to create an interesting shot. With handheld, pulling focus and even pulling zoom is pretty easy. You would need a wireless follow focus system when shooting with the Steadicam. But, as you can see in this side-by-side -side comparison, the motion is stylistically different. With a steady cam, you float along with the actors. Shoulder mount introduces bumps with each step, which gives us more of a documentary feel. Think shows like The Office, which have more of a, a fly-on-the-wall feel than the omniscient point of view that steady cam offers. So, after spending 30 minutes reshooting the scene with the shoulder cam, we gave the brushless gimbal motor stabilizer one more chance. I first let my second cameraman, Chris, take a shot at the scene, but he hadn't walked the camera move before, so I took the realm. I was tired, but on the very first take, the gimbals just weren't going to cooperate with us. After one take, my arms were completely giving out. And at the end of the run, I made the executive decision to move on without the shot. Now this experiment illustrates something very important that isn't really talked about much with these brushless motor stabilizers. I've seen some spectacular footage in press releases, but the fundamental truth about brushless motor stabilizers is they are a high tech solution to the camera movement problem. Each brushless motor, each battery hookup, the computer software, the wireless control, the accelerometer, all of those are single point failures, which means if any one of those fails, the whole system fails. On the contrary, the center of gravity stabilizer has just one single point failure, the gimbal. There are no other moving parts. They are a very low tech solution to the camera movement problem. Does this make the brushless motor stabilizer inherently bad? Of course not, but it does make it less reliable and more temperamental on set. Flying a center of gravity stabilizer, although requires skill and practice, takes a lot less muscle. And once you have it balanced, you have to do very minor maintenance on it to keep it working throughout the day. Now, because we were shooting on this C300 using a Cine lens, I think our problem was we had too much weight for the gimbal setup. We also didn't have the passcode to get into the software, so we really couldn't say we gave the brushless motor stabilizer a fair shot. But in the real world, with all the imperfections that come with it, maybe we did. Let's switch back to the blocking. Now, since there was going to be no cutting in the shot, you have to block the movement to create little individual compositions and then link them all through movement. I wanted to demonstrate the power relationship between the sergeant and the detective, which means I wanted her to always be leading him along. 
And as a result, she tends to be, always be closer to the camera than he is. Notice that they discuss the details at the, of the case at his desk. She puts up her hand on her face in frustration. This is almost like a shield to bad news, ultimately turning her back on him completely and not making eye contact until she comes up with a solution. From here, I wanted her path to take us around the corner desk by the jail cell and into the sergeant's office, creating an S movement. At first, she had trouble with this direction because she needed motivation to take an indirect path. So I had her drop off an envelope at the desk. You can't see it in the take, but it makes sense for her character. Unfortunately, that area by the jail cell is really darkly lit, so I had them scurry through that spot as, fa as fast as possible. When they get to the office, she ends up being bathed in light, while he is wrapped in shadow, a perfect visual symbolism of their relationship. But once again, a good visual metaphor that occurred completely out of dumb luck. So far, we've been playing this scene like it was straight out of something like Law and Order. Let's try something a little different. Captain. Detective, make it quick. I only have a minute. Any news on the Mendoza case? Uh, Jenkins isn't talking. He's been in there for 15 hours. Exactly, one hour before we legally have to release him. And the forensics? Uh, toxicology came back negative. Uh, the blood work is clean. There's no fingerprints at the scene, so it looks like we're at a dead end. I don't like dead ends. I don't like losing. We're fighting the clock on this one. Mendoza's got an army of lawyers breathing down our necks, so if we overstep this thing... <gasps> lawyers. Mendoza's lawyer. Well, what about him? If Mendoza is washing his hands, then you find the soap. Okay. So put a detail on him. I want to know every move that he makes. I'll put Nimi on it. If I'm right, that snake is going to lead us right to the prize. What about Jenkins? Make him sweat it out another hour. Have a big showy uh, escort take him back? He'll think that Mendoza talked. Yes, Captain. Darren, mm -hmm. keep me posted. I need this. This unit needs this. <laughs> First up, you'll notice we went from using a CinemaScope style 2.35 aspect ratio to a more spacious 1.77 aspect ratio, the 16 by 9 television standard. Now you tend to see many comedies employing a less wide aspect ratio. It offers a little more vertical space for actors to work with. Now because of this, it feels a little friendlier. The other obvious choice change was the music, which certainly adds a more lighthearted feel to the scene. Now having just shot the one I really wanted to block a scene that had a lot of movement. The sergeant's objective here is to romantically engage the detective but still do her job. The detective's objective is to just get out of there once he realizes what's going on. Now, one thing I really like to play with is reversing eye lines and positions. In the beginning of the scene, the sergeant circles around the detective. He's constantly turning to follow her, creating this power dynamic between the two, similar to what we saw in that one -er. As she closes in romantically, I had her move into the foreground and close the blinds. The details of the case that the detective are, is spouting aren't really that important. I'm letting them play out in the background. What's important is why she's doing what she's doing. I let it play in this two shot because that emphasizes the subtext of the scene. Now when she returns to him, we have reversed the blocking, which creates a new objective for the detective. He's got his orders and now he needs to get out of there, but she's in his way. So as she's playing with him, he can sheepishly try to get to the door. This interplay only made possible because we reversed the blocking, which then sets up this little door slamming joke, something the actress improvised on one of her takes. So like a mouse caught in a trap, he's at her mercy. Even though the sergeant does still bring everything back to the police work at hand, she teases him at the end by invading his personal space and playing with his uh, pencil subtext. 
Originally, I had planned to shoot a version where the detective was actually the bad guy in the case, sort of a twist on the show Dexter, and used the camera to get increasingly closer and closer to his face like a noose tightening around his neck. But since we were having so much fun with the comedic versions and we needed something with a little more energy, I scrapped that idea because it felt too subtle considering what we had just done. Jacked up on free YouTube coffee and cookies we had at craft services, I let the actors all come up with a funny version of their own. Captain. Detective, make it quick. I only have a minute. What's the news on the Mendoza case? Jenkins isn't talking. He has been in there for 15 hours. Exactly one hour before we legally have to let him go. And the forensics? <sighs> Toxicology came back negative. The blood work is clean. There's no fingerprints at the scene. So, looks like we're at a dead end. I'm not a big fan of dead ends. I don't like losing. Well, we're fighting the clock here. Mendoza's got an army of lawyers breathing down our necks, so if we so much as overstep this thing... Myers, Mendoza's lawyer. What about him? If Mendoza is washing his hands, then you find the soap. That's Myers. Put a detail on him, and I want to know every move that he makes. <clears throat> Well, what about Jenkins? Let him sweat it out for another hour, and then have a big showy escort take him back. Mendoza will think that he talked. Yes, Captain. Darren, mm -hmm. keep me posted. Got it. This unit needs this. I need this. I really enjoyed this version because it was a group effort and expanded the universe to include all the background actors. Now, because of such an intricate blocking, the camera placement really had to just be transparent, just capture it all on frame, which is why most of it stays on wide so we get both the dialogue in the foreground and the antics in the background. But there's one thing worth pointing out here that I completely missed as I directed and edited this. It wasn't until I studied the scene in preparing this discussion that I even notice it. In the very beginning, if you watch carefully, I break the 180 degree rule. The 180 degree rule states that you should create an imaginary line between the actors speaking in a scene and then keep all your camera angles to one side of that line. I like to think of it like you're shooting a play in a theater. You can place the camera anywhere in the audience, but you can't go on stage and shoot out into the audience. That's the 180 degree line or the action line. So if we diagram this scene, we see that the opening wide shot starts us with the camera on the bottom right side of this action line. The reverse on the sergeant keeps the camera on the same side, but the medium on the detective jumps the action line shooting from the top left. So why does this scene still work if I broke a fundamental filmmaking rule? Well, the short answer is because if I didn't catch it until I diagrammed it, it wasn't that noticeable to begin with. But let's try to explore this just a little bit deeper. The first shot of the scene establishes the geography of the scene. If we think of this layout as our stage, with the jail at the back of the stage and the bars upstage, we can imagine this as a stage play. We find that our action line is not really the one created by the islands at all, but rather created parallel to the jail cell door. If we set our action line here, we see that almost all the shots stay on one side of the action line, all except for one angle, the reverse shot on the sergeant looking through the bars. But why is this not confusing? Well, because the bars are there to give us a visual clue about where she is in relationship to the set. In essence, we have been conditioned to understand that this is a reverse angle. We don't register it as off because there's no, no visual clues that tell us that it's off. Remember that the purpose of the 180 rule isn't that you have to have your cameras on one side of the action line, it's there to keep you from creating confusing or jarring edits. But as you experiment more with blocking and camera movement, the action line will pick up and move, and there are times when you can cheat and get away with slightly fudging it. I'm sure we will get into the advanced implications of the 180 degree rule in a future episode. I would like to thank all the cast and crew for helping us put together this little filmmaking demonstration and the folks at YouTube Space LA for their generosity. Now, filmmaking doesn't end with the script. A lot can happen beyond the page. And each choice that's being made, whether that's to stand on one side of the table or the other, 
can create deeper and richer context to your film. Now, I'm not saying the script doesn't matter. You can have a great script and a lousy movie, but I doubt the reverse is true. Ultimately, a lot of decisions have to be made to commit script into image and sound. But if there's one thing I want you to take away from this, it's this. You cannot learn filmmaking by just watching films. Just like you cannot learn to run a restaurant kitchen by dining out every single night. Watching films is a must, but it is not enough because all you see are the end results. You don't get exposed to the countless decisions, the pressures and the choices that are required to bring a movie together. So if you want to be a filmmaker, you must make films. There's no going around it. Every project you create gives you something to build upon, but you've got to create. You've got to get out there and get that experience before you can make something great. I'm John Hess, and I'll see you at filmmakeriq.com.